Welcome back. We will now turn our focus to psychological defense and disinformation in regard to culture and cultural heritage. Helping us with that is our next speaker, who has a background as priest in the Church of Sweden, but in her current role at the Swedish Psychological Defense Agency, focuses on identifying and analyzing myths and disinformation with the aim to strengthen the resilience of the Swedish population and society. Please welcome senior analyst Lisa Mobrand. So, you should never start with disclaimers, but I like to break rules, so I start with disclaimers. Uh, it's, I mean, you can't help, but probably uh, you, I will repeat some of the things that have been said before today. And you should take it as an example of how well we coordinate and cooperate with other parts of Swedish society, agencies and civil societies, not as me being boring. Uh, and it's also very important to understand that I will speak from the viewpoint of a Swedish defense agency, which means we have a mandate to protect against foreign information manipulation. And I will speak mainly from a viewpoint of an agency in a country that has been spared from war in more than 200 years. That means that some of you would find me unnecessarily alarmistic, probably the Swedes, and others will find me unnecessarily late to the party. Uh, probably our, our other European friends <laughs> in the other countries. Because uh, a lot of our friends in other countries know this threat a lot better, have felt it in their own lives. Uh, and if you listen closely to the Swedish uh, Defense Research Agency earlier today, you know that their report has uh, many important aspects that um, we also cooperate with when it comes to um, actor-driven threats towards the cultural heritage. Um, and the last disclaimer, I am of course deeply invested in the protection of the material cultural her heritage, but for natural reasons, since my mandate is about the information environment, I will mainly speak about the immaterial heritage and the narratives about our cult cultural heritage. That doesn't mean I'm not invested in the protection of the physical, the material uh, cultural heritage. Uh, since I don't want to take too much time in uh, explaining uh, the agency, I'm just going to browse through that. This is our portal paragraph. We safeguard our open and democratic society uh, and counter foreign malign information inter, uh, influence. And we're a Swedish defense agency, but as you all know, since uh, the 7th or 8th of March, we're a part of NATO, which means that we cooperate with NATO, we cooperate with the European Union, and also we have some other international corporations. But we our main task as a defense agency is still Sweden. And in peacetime, as well as during uh, heightened awareness, uh, alert and war, we should lead the coordination and develop the work of agencies and other stakeholders in Sweden's psychological defense. We should contribute to strengthening resilience. Here's the word again that had different meanings within the population, and that's my main task. And of course, further international cooperation and coordination. But here's another question about definition. What is psychological defense? It's very important to understand that it's not a clinical psychology we're talking about. And also, psychological defense, even though we're the agency mainly responsible for coordinating it, we are not the only actors within the psychological defense. You are also actors within Sweden's or international psychological defense. Because when this works, it's a coordinated effort. And it's also a preemptive effort to try to resist information interference. And to speak, military speak, uh, hybrid threats is a very important uh, and very interesting concept that, are, that is used a lot. And a lot of the times we're not specific when we talk about it. And uh, information interference is a part of the hybrid threat. And sometimes we call it cognitive warfare. And the reason I do that is to scare the Swedes. Uh, because this is the kind of war that's going on right now. It's not about when the war comes, it's, it's already here. 
And the thing about hybrid threats, such as information warfare, of course, it targets free societies because they're vulnerable, because they're free and open. And they also use uh, this as a way of preparing the way for possibly a war or just destruction of that society. And I think a big case in point here is, of course, Ukraine. The invasion does not start the 22, it started long before that, with a lot of information campaigns. And the most important part is that uh, FEMI, as a, like, which is the acronym for it, it uses, or rather I'd say abuses, the democratic freedoms in an open society. And they're often working uh, within the guise of those freedoms, trying to hide themselves within free speech, the right to form organizations and so forth. And the definition uh, that of the threat for us of coordinated activity from a foreign hostile power using misleading or false information. And uh, the definition of foreign hostile powers is not ours, it's the Swedish security police. So there are some uh, countries that are being named, Russia, no surprise, Iran, China, but there's also the issue of international networks such, such as Islamistic networks, anti-authoritarian and terroristic networks. And a foreign information manipulation and interference campaign is trying to influence political decision, which is pretty simple to understand. But sometimes we forget that it can also be opinions in the public or parts of the population, which can make us kind of miss that this is actually what's going on. Because the political level, we know that Diplomacy, different kinds of sanctions has always been a way of trying to influence. But this is a covert way of trying to manipulate through sometimes the population or parts of populations as well. And sometimes it's about the decision making or opinions about Sweden in another country. Which will in turn affect our security and our ability to cooperate with other countries. And that, of course, threatens free countries' interests, security, and agency. And this is very important uh, in a West European context. Is uh, in the general uh, debate or the in general um, well discussion about this. Sometimes uh, the word information warfare or uh, information interference are used uh, about things within the national context. But for us, as a defense agency we have to make a difference between what's happening in the national context and what happens outside. But of course, those inter, they're interplaying. Free speech, the free forming of opinions, the right to have debates, and sometimes polarized debates or vulnerabilities within that climate is what information warfare is using. Uh, and they're trying to hide within this public debate as a way of making it harder to attribute, as we say. And what's a successful malign information campaign? Well, it's propagating a narrative intended to skew the target audience opinion in an important issue or several important issues. And it's using the domestic information environment and its vulnerabilities. You can't just make shit up. You have to use something that's already, you know, a question, a polarity, a debate within a society. So you have to make a target uh, analysis. And the word narrative, I love the word narrative, <laughs> being a classically <laughs> educated person. We always talk about narratives as something bad, and I'm afraid I'm going to do that too. But as you also know, narrative is something we all need. But I'm going to start about common narratives used in information warfare or FEMI. Is of course, you know this, the old story, the elite versus the people. And you need those narratives, as I would say, you need to piggyback on, on top of an, a big narrative to be able to uh, put in this information in an information environment. Because people, as all artists know, need to create meaning. And we create meanings through stories. And some stories are very powerful. This is a very powerful story. The elite doesn't care about us, the political leaders and so forth. Our values are being threatened. It's a very important narrative within information uh, manipulation. We are losing our identity. 
the apocalypse, not the theological ap apocalypse, I would say, but the society is crumbling very soon. And of course, the old conspiracy theories are being reused because they're very, they have always, they usually have a very interesting explanation, but they also give the person that has a conspiracy theory or believes it also feel that they're part of something bigger. They know something that other people don't know. And it's a very powerful feeling sometimes. And I'm afraid to say that anti-Semitism is one of the oldest uh, conspiracy theories that always come back. And some of these things is a rehash of what Anna and Sofia said, I hope. I'd like to point out the fact that the narrative can uh, sometimes be skewed either towards a foreign country, but sometimes within a country in itself, trying to, you know, polarize the debate within a country. And something that's also very important to know about is diaspora interference, which is a peacetime threat. They often hide within cultural uh, efforts. And I think uh, our sister here from Pussy Riot was talking about when you're trying to hide information uh, interference as a cultural effort or corporations or some kind of uh, education or religious freedom. Some homeworks for the Swedes. What picture is this? <laughs> it's, the, uh, it's Gustav Vasa riding into Stockholm 1523, the founding father of Sweden as we know it now. Is this picture historically correct? Is it politically neutral? Mm? Does it tell us more about Sweden 1523 or 1908 when this was uh, painted? Yeah, and your Norwegians know why 1908 was a sensitive year to Swedes. So, of course, when we talk about narratives and we talk about foreign information interference, we have to understand that we also have a history, even in Western countries, of using our own history and our cultural heritage to create a narrative, usually a streamlining narrative. Uh, my kid is a part of a Swedish minority, and the narrative there was that if to be a Swede, you have to speak the same language. And it kind of worked, because their language is practically dead. And this, this picture was made during a political and cultural interesting time in Sweden. Sweden wanted to manifest itself as a nation and consolidate a view on the Swedish history and cultural heritage. And as a material cultural heritage, it's vulnerable, I know, because it's a mural. But I think the story in this picture is not as important. And sometimes it's the other way around. The artifact in itself is not the important thing, but the history or the narrative about the artifact. Think about that. That doesn't mean I don't love this. I love this and I want it to be saved in case of war, of course. But I think sometimes you have to understand, is it the, the artifact in itself or is it the narrative that it's being threatened? But I would also like to remind you that values, and sometimes language, is a cultural value, is a cultural heritage. And I would say, I mean, this is not specifically to Sweden, but I would say this, these are very Swedish cultural heritage, especially the last one about children's rights. And it's important to understand that a lot of the uh, foreign information against uh, information manipulation against Sweden and West, Western countries target our values. And artistic expressions of freedom or use in controversial subjects are often ridiculed, ridiculed in FEMI and used as an example of the decadence of the Western world. And uh, a lot of the narratives about Sweden, especially in Russian uh, uh, Islamistic uh, information environments, is about Sweden as an LGBTQ-ridden decadent society where families are falling apart. And that's like a reoccurring narrative and it's being especially used by the Russian Orthodox Church and the Islamistic information environment. And I also like to remind us that, oh, sorry, I think I, yeah. I'm afraid to say that because, I mean, I have a background in the Church of Sweden, that Sweden, uh, our openness, uh, our, well, I would say it's a result of 200 years of freedom, but sometimes it has also made us vulnerable because we don't understand 
what is culture and what is actually FEMI. And here's an example, a Russian Orthodox Church right next to the airport in Westeros. I'd like to end with that, what heritage are we defending? Because of course, as I said, we're defending the material heritage, but for me, when I usually talk about cultural heritage, I like to talk about the right to form organization. This is a Swedish, uh, you know, ladies getting together and stitching things up to, uh, to uh, collect money for poor people. This is the right of public access in Sweden. This is the possibility to educate yourself during your entire life, not only to educate yourself to become something important or useful, but to learn for the sake of learning, to debate, to learn new things. The free print, uh, I think it's from 1744, right? It's a cultural heritage, a material and immaterial cultural heritage. Of course, the material cultural heritage, but also the narrative and the meaning and how we use them. And of course, children's culture and the right for children to have a culture that is not just ed you know, educational or you know, being some kind of, uh, well, the right to be anarchistic in a way. This is a very anarchistic story for children. So I think this is very important. When we talk about comprehensive psychological defense, we talk about openness within society, but it's not open if we don't understand that we are being manipulated sometimes. An educated and discerning public is very important, but we still need the trust within groups, and this is actually what they're trying to target by polarizing society. And i like to end with two good resources. Uh, it's the EU external action, where they collect narratives. You can go in there and look at narratives aimed towards uh, culture in Europe. And the other one is our handbook for to how to um, defend against foreign information manipulation. I think I'm done, right? Questions? <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I wonder if you could uh, develop what you just talked about uh, of foreign interference and uh, how can you reduce the effect of foreign interference and at the same time respect the freedom of speech? How do you really counteract those two? I think it's very hard because there's always, uh, you were talking, the Hanna Holman uh, lady, I'm afraid I forgot your name, you were talking about. Uh, the vocabulary is so different between the security sector and the cultural sector. Mm. So sometimes the issue in itself is to start having discussions where we actually meet uh, and discuss uh, what we're actually protecting. And I think it's, uh, there tend to be, in, especially in, in countries, not used to having those kind of threats. As soon as we're threatened, we want to rein everything in. And what surprises me most is actually some of the agents that I thought would talk about freedom of speech are the ones trying to rein it in now. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, maybe it's uh, some kind of reflex when mm -hmm. you're threatened. And I think it's uh, the most important part is to keep on this discussion about... Uh, we have to be able to, as long as we are able to uh, use uh, our own responsibility in this, to not having to use legislation, trying to work together and not see each other as threats. Uh, because legislation is of cor course good in some matters, <laughs> But the threat actors, they don't care about our legislation. So it's better if we can try to find ways of cooperate uh, when it comes to the borders between different things. And yeah. I think, uh, especially, uh, I say a lot of the Western countries have laws, but they're so different between uh, different countries. We yeah. have to understand that when we cooperate between countries Absolutely. as well. Mm. A lot of uh, foreign uh, visitors to our agency, they come like four or three times a week. <laughs> say, so how can the Swedish civil society actually work? Mm. This is impossible. And I always say, you know, it's like the story about the bumblebee. It doesn't know it's not supposed to be able to fly, <laughs> so it flies. <laughs> but this is also what we have to protect uh, when they're trying to give us quick solutions. We have to say, like, as so far this has worked, this huge level of freedom. But we have to start discuss 
responsibilities rather than legislation in mm. this case. Mm. Well, thank you, Lisa. A warm applause to Lisa. Thank you.